What's up guys, this is Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself, where we change lives through volleyball, training, and inspirational content. Welcome to my Volleyball Coach Reaction to High Q Season 3, Episode 3. If you're new to this channel, I'm a volleyball coach, volleyball player, and personal trainer who provides volleyball tutorials, jump training workouts, and other cool volleyball videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for more content. If I were in Ushiwaka's shoes, I actually might think the same thing about Hinata because on the outside, if, especially if you don't know Hinata on a personal level, it can just seem like arrogance because what has Hinata truly accomplished to warrant his level of confidence? But if you do know Hinata on a more personal level, then you're going to see it actually comes from a very pure place that he just has this deep level of self-belief. Thanks for clarifying that dialogue between Tsuki's older brother and the, the audience. It is really interesting to see Tsuki's development process as he's hyper-focused on what he sees and hopefully developing into a more instinctive player. But that's going to take a lot of conscious thought and a lot of exposure to high-level teams that are going to force him to be better on a mental level as a blocker. Because as a blocker, you can't always depend on what you see. A lot of it is your instinct and experience based on what you feel is going to happen. Because instinct is what happens in your subconscious. You're making thousands of calculations in a moment. Whereas your conscious brain, you're only able to process two or three things at a time. So it's a little bit slower and you can't process as much information. So the goal is to develop enough conscious ability to eventually transfer that into subconscious ability and make it become instinct. Even though it's almost been a year since I started doing my Haikyuu reaction videos, it actually feels like two to three years. I think it's because I've done so many episodes already, like um, 60 Haikyuu videos. But man, thanks for joining me on this journey and thanks for recognizing the upcoming one year anniversary. I always forget that the original Haikyuu writer and artist also did horror anime which is interesting to see because you get to see some of the elements from the horror genre which is a completely different genre than haiku lead its way into the haiku anime if you've been enjoying my videos please consider supporting me on patreon where you receive exclusive access to my monthly live q a sessions monthly podcasts my private blog behind the scenes footage and more now let's get this high cue party started. Sakai! Starting off with a bang. Oh, we got that drifting attack from Hinata, but the reaction block from the horror character. Uh, game 3-3. Three, three. I think this is the second set. So Karasuno is finally able to start adapting to their opponent. The guest monster. Geshu. My guess is that the middle is very instinctual, at least from Shiratoizawa. That's why they call him the guest monster. He just fully commits to what he feels or who he feels is going to hit. So it's all or nothing block. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know if that's guessing, because that's actually a real blocking move. To be able to go straight ahead, and then as you read them, Going across the body, you shift your hands. But maybe Itsuki is going to watch him and learn from him. <laughs> More violence from Kageyama. Good pass from Daichi. Let's see who he sets here. Wow, he read him really early. 
and he swished his hands in the air. That was incredible. We gotta watch that scene again. Based on Kageyama's posture, it's actually hard to read what he's gonna do. The only thing I can see in Kageyama's setting form to give away his set early is that his hands are, are straight, or sorry, his elbows are straight. So usually when setters lock their elbows, they're, they're over preparing themselves for a quick set. Because it is easier to set a quick set when your elbows are locked, it's forcing you to only use your wrist. Other than that, you know, Kageyama's pretty neutral, and the horror guy, I, I forgot his name, I'm sure I'll learn it throughout this, this episode. He's reading the set early, he sees Hinata running the shoot, and not only is he able to read the set early, he's able to make the adjustment at the last minute to block Hinata, which takes tons, tons of experience. The only blocker I know who can do that on a consistent basis is David Lee from the US national team. He was in the Olympics from 2008, 2012, and 2016, and one of the best instinctive blockers. You should watch the, the quarterfinal match, no, the semifinal match against USA and Russia in the 2008 Olympics. I think he wins the game with like three blocks in the fifth set. Just pure instincts. There's some moves where he's just in the air and then he drops one hand and he gets a stuff block against a very big, powerful team like Russia. And it's really amazing to see, but one of the best instinctive blockers that I know of. So he jumps right and then recovers left with his hands. That was an impressive blocking move. <laughs> Looks like a zombie now. I don't know why they call him the guest monster. They should call him the reed monster. Yeah, blocking, it's one of the toughest jobs. You have to keep track of so many hitters, and if you're wrong, you're gonna leave your other blockers exposed with just one blocker. So I, I can't wait to hear his explanation as to how he's able to read. Time out from Takeda Sensei. There's the teammate with the bad haircut. Let's see what he says. <laughs> see, that's how you know Ushiwaka's character. He doesn't care if another player is better than him. Yeah, when a blocker can read you, that's got to be frustrating as a setter because part of your job is being deceptive. I got to read this one. Understanding instead of reading. Let's see what they mean by guest block. I still don't understand why they say that. And it helps that if you're a little taller, you can be wrong a couple times and recover from that. So we just have to be consistent. Don't get overwhelmed by some of his crazy reads because it does require 
he is going to be wrong. <laughs> oh, that was funny. We got to watch that one again. I was like, what the heck is going on with, with Kageyama? But he's saying, does Kageyama have to do something crazy to throw him off? <laughs> and even the other front row players are trying to read Kageyama. He's going to wait to the last second to try to make a move. Oh. And he beat the guest monster finally. Sorry, I wasn't saying much. I was just so in tuned to trying to read and understand what Coach Ukai was saying as he was explaining what the guest monster was doing and why he was so good at blocking. So the downside of intuition and instinct, which is what Coach Ukai said, is you're going to be wrong sometimes. And I mean, the benefit is that you're going to fully stop a play. Now, if you never guess and if you never try to read, you're always going to be at the mercy of the setter. Because if you're a blocker, don't just wait to see what's going to happen before you go. Sometimes at some level, you have to develop the ability to be one step ahead of the setter by reading his body language and trying to guess because at the higher levels, the setting is so fast that you just can't physically close by reacting to it. And that's actually similar to a libero. If you're a defensive specialist, you can't just wait to see where the ball's gonna go before you actually go for it, right? We all know that spikes are really fast at the higher level. So liberos have to do the same thing where they're trying to read the setter and the hitter to make an educated guess on where the hitter's going to hit the ball and also base that on what your blockers are doing. So I would say the libero's job is almost just as hard as the middles because you have one more factor. You have to read around your own block as well as the setter and the hitter. And that means that as a libero, sometimes you're going to be wrong. But the only way to dig those really hard, spectacular attacks is to fully commit to what you think is going to happen. And then, and then also the only way you get better at reading is by reading more often. So that means you're going to be wrong a lot in the beginning. And I tell that to my players a lot, that when you're first starting to read serves and read hitters, your intuition is going to be off because you're basing it on a small base of knowledge. But the only way to get better at reading is to try to read something. And if you're right, great. Your brain makes that connection with that body language and remembers that that body language meant they were going to hit this area. But if you're wrong, then you also make that connection and say, Ooh, I thought they were going to do this, but that body language really means they're going to do that. And the only way to get there is to be okay with being wrong and just practicing reading. But the problem is not many players can stomach those type of errors. Meaning when you read wrong, you look really bad. So the key to getting better is can you look beyond your own self-consciousness and focus on trying to get better at reading without worrying about how you look. That's the key. And I think Kageyama probably really just had to wait to the very last minute to make a decision, which is takes a lot of patience. <laughs> he really did try to make this, this magenta hair guy look like a zombie. <laughs> this guy's personality is pretty funny too. This is called spreading out the offense there. So they are running Hinata all the way to the antenna to make the zombie guy move as far as possible and they keep showing these these panning scenes to Tsuki like he's thinking something but they're not going to say what he's thinking yet <laughs> I 
Uh, these little side side conversations are so funny. That's what makes Haikyuu special is all those those mini human conversations that happen, the awkward moments too. Ooh, hitting right over the double block. Let's see what Kageyama does. Oh. That was interesting. He was pretending to follow Hinata and then he tried to fake. The, then he ended up committing the other way. This is a pretty cool battle. And middles. This is rare that middles do this. But it does happen because sometimes when you're that aggressive, you're going to try to play games with the setter. But I like that. I like that Tendo is... I finally remembered his name. I like that Tendo is just fully committed to his job as a blocker. But yeah, it is dangerous, just like Coach Ukai saying here. You know, blocking is not about just scoring points all by yourself. It's also about synchronizing with your team and taking away space. Because if you overcommit, you, like we said, you're going to leave your other blockers exposed. And there we have the big crush from Ushiwaka. Blocks evolve. It is a dance between attacking and blocking. They are adapting to each other constantly. I think it's great to have Takeda Sensei's perspective because he doesn't play volleyball. He is providing such a raw, innocent observation. Oh, now we get to see a contrast between Suki's blocking and Tendo. <laughs> it's the normal guy. <laughs> oh, how funny. Now, Suki, he, this is probably where we get to see him shine because. The camera's been showing his face a lot, but he hasn't been saying anything. This is his... The pump one, but he's probably going to read that. Ho oh, ho, Tsuki, finally. <laughs> he's been studying. Good job, Tsuki. <laughs> Our wild beast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, I love Tsuki's response. So cool, so chill. Let's see what he's processing here. He sees and he goes. He waits. Oh, did he just block Ushijima? No. I think it just got on the inside of the block. But he's right there. The fact that you can touch it, you can block it. And he read the right play. He didn't get faked out by Tendo. Oh, we get to see Tsuki's older brother there cheering. Oh, that's right. We still have yet to see Yamaguchi's float serve to save the day against Shiro Toyozawa. That was an interesting eye contact exchange. Like he knew him. <laughs> I love that. Let's look at that again. Yet another mark of growth in Yamaguchi. Giving off that aura that coach, I'm ready. And coaches love that. Coaches can tell when a player wants to go in or not. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll put you in. But the worst thing you could do as a player is to act like you don't want to go in. Like if you're acting scared, even if you are feeling a little scared inside, you have to be ready and mentally 
And when the coach says, hey, do you know how to do this? <laughs> Even if you don't know how, sometimes you just gotta fake it, right? Just say yes and then quickly ask a player. And then when you go on, then you're gonna know how to do it. But you gotta use every opportunity you can to try to fight for court time. So I love that scene. And I love this animation of that, that black aura where it's like Akuma charging his dark energy. It, it's, it's really a great way to show the intensity of Yamaguchi right now. I just can't wait to see for him to come on the court. Wow, Karasuna's only down by two points. And Suki with another stuff block. Free ball transition here. Wow, Ushijima playing some one-handed defense. And Suki with another soft block. That is frustrating as a hitter. Oh, right in between two players. One of the best places to hit. And Tanaka, of course. Never giving up. <laughs> wow. Shiratoi Zawa's coach getting upset. I love it. The demon coach. You have different styles. You have the yellers. You have the, the thinkers. You have the calm talkers. So, looks like the Shiratoi Zawa is definitely a yelling coach. Oh, we got Suga and Kageyama combo. I love it when they go in and do something tricky. Synchronize attack. And they set Kageyama hitting down the line. And we see it's like, wow, that's the first time we saw Kageyama get into it like that. <laughs> Man, this guy looks intense. Look at those eyebrows. Look how thick they are. He looks like a demon. That's a that's a really did that's a really cool really cool illustration. Polishing diamonds in the best way possible. Maybe he's saying, let your best player continue to get better and better and better. Oh, so it looks, I wonder if they can recruit in Japan for high school volleyball teams. That's illegal in the US. I'd love to get some more insight on the demon coach and how he runs Shua Toizawa. So it looks like the demon coach's philosophy is you find one or two big bangers and you build your entire system around them. Keep it simple. Structure the entire team that Ushijima gets most of the sets. That's definitely one way of success. But long term, oh, and he can pass? Wow. In serve receive. I knew he could play defense, but doing serve receive is a completely different skill. Can't serve Nishinoya. Wow. And Hinata continues his great performance. Oh, this is their chance to make a run because I think Tendo's in the back row, so he's not blocking. Oh, yes. We finally get to see Yamaguchi. Is he going to serve to help them finish the set because it's so close? Here's one pattern I'm noticing. Every time Yamaguchi is about to serve, they show the animation of the reflection onto the wood floor. So I wonder if they do that for other servers or if that's something special to signify that Yamaguchi's on the court. And even look at the muscular detail on the ankle muscles, the soleus, the, the gastrocnemius, the anterior tibialis, those are all the muscles, the major muscles around your, your uh, lower leg bone. I love, I just can't get enough of this animation. I'm so 
inspired by it makes me want to draw again I got a signature deep breath I wonder how many takes they had to do for the voice actor <laughs> to get the breath right probably had to exhale like 300 times before they chose the best one and we even got some encouragement from Tsuki come on Yamaguchi Ooh, a little wobbly there yeah but now they have to set Ushijima, see if they can stop him. But can Yamaguchi get a dig and save the day? Good. I just need one high toss. Crush. Oh man, he just spanked the ball. <laughs> so I don't know if Yamaguchi is experiencing frustration because he hit a great serve. He threw the team out of system into a predictable offense and now he has to come off the court because Ushijima still gets a kill. So I don't know if he's nervous by actually getting to fully experience the power on the court or whether he's frustrated. One thing I remember being a serving specialist at one point in my volleyball career, sometimes you hit your best serve and you throw them out of system and then your team doesn't do the job to try to block the ball or to dig in transition. It can be frustrating because you feel like, gosh, I hit my best serve. I want to keep staying on the court. I want to keep serving. And curious to see what Yamaguchi's thinking here. Or maybe Yamaguchi is motivated to play better defense. He's like, you know what? I want to stay on the court longer. And Suki's frustrated too. <laughs> Brook. Oh man, Tendo trash talking is the best. But you need someone a little bit off like him on the team just to keep things loose. Sensei. Let's see what their next game plan is. Maybe they can bring Suga permanently on to have Kagiyama three hitters in the front row at all times and a bigger block. Yeah, you just got to be patient. Don't try to win the game on one hit. Every point has equal value. <laughs> yeah it's about winning is a marathon it's about what you're willing to do for a long period of time yeah, good words from coach Ukai so they just need to stay consistent with what they're doing and let's see what Suki's thinking here Wow, he's inserting himself. He's taking ownership. This is what you want to see from your players. Taking ownership of their role, but also injecting their own ideas and their own game plans because the best thing you can do as a coach is to teach them the game at a high level and then eventually teach them how to teach themselves. And the fact that Suki wants to implement his own strategy he is able to see something that maybe even Coach Ukai can't see or some of the other experienced players can't see. So this is great. Can't wait to see what this ends up happening. Don't forget to pass to Waka. Oh. To pass to Wakatoshi, maybe he means to set him on two, like on the second contact. Here we got the cool hair guy. Great pass. Does he get the tool of the block? That was too fast. Yes, he did. 21 21. Daichi with a bruise on his face. <laughs> oh, is that a slowdown from 
Ushijima spike. Just enough. Let's see if they can convert in transition. I'll be happy too. You just got a soft pocket from Ushijima. And he extended the rally. That's better than Ushijima crushing it. So close. 21 22. Oh, he's going to do something smart. There you go. But picked up from Chiritoizawa. And, man, what a luxury to have Ushijima. Let's see if we can synchronize with Tsuki's timing here. I think we talked about how you want to jump a little later on bigger hitters here. Oh, right to Nishinoya. Great absorption. <laughs> Super libero. They finally got the dig. Oh, Kageyama red. Tendo. There you go. That's how you have to score in transition. After the second set, they worked so hard just to get one clean play. And now they have the first chink in the armor for Shiro Toyozawa. Here are my immediate reactions to episode 3. One of the coolest moments was when Takeda Sensei was sharing his observations on how the hitters and blockers are kind of dancing with each other. They're responding to each other, you know, hitter hits down the line, blocker takes away the line. Hitter hits in the angle, blocker reads angle, and then now a hitter has to change it again. And I emphasize this to my players a lot where getting blocked is not the end of the world. I like to get see getting blocked as getting information. You get to see what the blockers are truly capable of. And secondly, it also forces you to be better, right? It forces you to change and adapt and develop another type of swing that you never had to because now you're facing a blocker that can actually do something and stop your best hit. I'm so happy that I finally got to see Yamaguchi in the game. Unfortunately, he only came in to serve one point because Ushijima was just too good. But I'm pretty sure he's going to come in in the third and fourth set, and maybe fifth set if they can extend it that long with Shiratorizawa. And Yamaguchi, man, I'm, he's got to add some defense to his game, and I'm pretty sure he will because people that want to stay on the court longer are going to do anything they can to do it. And to see Tsuki contributing on this level, I feel like we've had to wait one full episode for Tsuki to care a little bit more. And then another, I'm sorry, not full episode, a full season. And then another full season for Tsuki to learn some new techniques. And then the beginning of the third season for him to finally want to contribute greater on the court. So he's definitely evolving at a slower rate compared to Hinata and Kageyama but he's evolving nonetheless. I think they should continue to use Kageyama to hit more because they aren't getting a lot of right side offense from Daichi. At least they're not showing a lot of it. And hopefully they'll continue to use Suga to run Kageyama just to mix it up. Because a team that is this good, you just have to keep throwing variety of weapons at them. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and depend on Hinata, you know, Asahi and Tanaka. You need to have a spread out offense to force Tendo to make decisions and just wear them down. And that's going to be the key. Can they wear down Shiro Toizawa, set up a good block, soft block the attack, dig it in transition, come back again with another spike. And against a bigger and more physical team, that's really one of the best ways to beat them is to serve tough and to just wear them down in transition. Be consistent with your defense and get as many hitting opportunities as you can. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We'll see you guys in the next one.